Conflict is yet again brewing in Europe. There have been allegations and counter-allegations as Russia and Ukraine and its Western allies have been both alleging that the other side is about to cause a war. There have been even some mobilizations of troops, threats of sanctions and even more severe measures. We'll be talking about all this in Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so over the past few uh, days and even weeks for that matter, we have been hearing a lot of news items, some of them in isolation that there are soldiers mobilizing. There have been statements by leaders from Ukraine, leaders from the West, including the US, which is quite far away. But nonetheless, Antony Blinken has been making some statements. The Russians also have been saying, you know, warning against a return to the kind of armed confrontation that used to be the norm in Europe in decades past. So could you maybe quickly take us through what is the situation on the ground as far as Russia and Ukraine are concerned? What are the issues at stake here? You see, the first thing, of course, is that the Donbas region, which has declared autonomy from Ukraine, it is not separated from uh, Ukraine, it was promised that there will be under the Minsk Accords, Minsk II Accords, if I remember correctly, that there would be a autonomy which would be guaranteed by certain steps that the uh, Ukrainian state would take. Those have not been implemented. And though Russia has talked about it uh, and written to uh, both Germany and France, who are the guarantors of the Minsk Accords, no steps have been taken by the Western powers on this at all. And the United States from the beginning has been a spoiler, as we know, wanting Ukraine to really expand up to Russia's borders, meaning NATO comes up to Russia's borders. It already has come to borders in other parts, but here too. And for Russia, that has been a no-no. A, of course, it's Crimea and Sevastopol, the naval port is involved, but also the fact that they do see themselves as protectors of the Russian ethnicity within Ukraine, which is really the Donbas region, and would what was really won through a civil war, virtual civil war in that part of the, of the world, that that gain should not be lost because the, both Germany and France took no measures and Russia did not take also any measure to see that autonomy which was promised in the Minsk Accord is really observed. Now it's also clear that the United States does not want to play by the Minsk playbook. They are very clear that they would like to come to the borders of Ukraine, the Donbas region, autonomy that since Ukraine, the current dispensation or the earlier one does not accept, it would like to de uh, dismantle it if it can, that that is something they would back. Why they would back that? Because they want Ukraine to join the NATO and Ukraine wants to that the autonomy of Donbas, reg Donbas region not be there. Right. And therefore, they would like to position their troops there also. This is a red line that is there, and this is what uh, Russia has said, that there is a red line they have, that if NATO comes to the Donbass region, supports Ukraine to come to the Donbass region, if the army, Ukrainian army, enters Donbass, then Russia would protect Donbass. That is the basic framework they have set, and this is where the conflict is. Because as far as the US is concerned, that region belongs to Ukraine, therefore Ukraine presumably has a right to take it back by arms. And the Minsk Accord, according to them, US was never a signatory to that, and Germany and France do not seem to want to own up to that as well. So therefore, that accord for them is dead. So Russia, if it prevents Ukraine from coming up to the borders, then that would be taken as a gesture of bad faith. It, if Russia intervenes, then it can possibly go to war conflict on the ground with not only Ukrainian troops, but with NATO troops as well. And the disturbing part in all of this are two kinds of threats we see emanating. One is from what a German uh, politician belonging to the Green Party, which is a part of the ruling coalition now, said that we could also use nu nuclear weapons in a first strike if Russians cross the border. Now, Threatening nuclear attacks in a first strike 
this is extremely dangerous talk because what you're talking about is the destruction of the human civilization that should be, should be done in this kind of way itself raises the temperature and makes such a possibility even more likely that you can trigger a nuclear war without you know without really intending to so that is one part of it the other threat that has come from uh, blinken and he seems to be the guy who seems to be handling our threats everywhere. And then we have various American emissaries to try and see, cool the uh, waters, whatever it is, uh, try and see that you can calm the issues down a little bit. So Blinken has said that severe financial sanctions, which will hurt Russia far beyond what we have done now, are they really talking about throwing Russia out of the, for instance, SWIFT uh, financial system? What are they really talking about when they say all of these things? Is it the interdependence of Europe that, after all, Russian gas comes to uh, Western Europe that they would like to uh, sanction so that ultimately Western Europe has to buy maybe American fracking gas? We're not clear about what these terms are. But the fact that Blinken is making this kind of threats also is war talk because ultimately financial war is a war. It, it should not be taken to be something which is not, because it's not a kinetic war, therefore it is not war. It is also an economic war, it's also war. So I think this kind of scenarios brings back memories of what we have seen earlier, brinkmanship of an order which we haven't seen in Europe for a long, long time. So I think that's what is, should be of cause for concern for everybody. And this threat of sanctions which the United States holds out, if other countries do not listen to them, I think is going to be on the agenda for all countries because we, in India for example, we have the S-400 issue right. and as you know, the Americans have also threatened India with sanctions, particularly if we buy this 400 uh, anti-missile uh, uh, batteries. batteries. So if we do that, that will also mean that it's not something only Russia will be facing a problem. All countries who deal with Russia, and we have serious you know, economic as well as uh, armaments deals with Russia, we would also be at risk as we were when the United States sanctioned Iran right. and our oil supplies were hit. So I think this is something the world has to come to terms with. Does the US have the right to disturb the world in any way it seeks fit? As long as it holds the financial powers, then it believes it can do so. And according to American terminology, set new international rules in place. So basically, still want to be the global number one, even if the other political economic you know, uh, scenario does not square up to that. This is what we seem to be seeing at the moment. So Ukraine is a test case, right. just as Taiwan is a test case under the freedom of navigation. On the other side, this is a test case. To one side, Ukraine with Russia and Taiwan with China. Right. So I think these are the two things to watch in the near future. Right, Prabir, actually my second question was regarding that because the Donbass issue has been around for quite some time. It's not something that began over the past few months. So what is the specific reason for this kind of escalation right now uh, when, you know, considering that Trump is no more there, people were saying that, okay, now it's a different ball game. But the Democratic administration seems to be even more hawkish in some ways. Well, I think on Russia, as we know, the Democratic uh, Party was always more hawkish than Trump was because if you don't forget, they said that Russia helped Trump to win. So from the beginning, they said we are the true opponents of Russians. Mm -hmm. On the question of China, Trump appeared to have been more hawkish by the economic war it waged on China. Coming back to the Donbass issue, as you know, Donbass uh, is really a fallout of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Right. And the fact that there are strong Russian ethnicities, Russian-speaking populations in different parts of Western, Eastern Europe, and it was true also for the Baltic states. A lot of them were either disenfranchised and then left, or a lot of them actually left. Right. So all those processes took place. I'm saying left because that's a nice way of putting it, but we know it was semi-coercive, if right. not coercive. 
in Ukraine, there is a very large population of that. And as we know, large population of even those who identify themselves as non-Russian speak Russian. In fact, some of the people who have ruled Ukraine were anti-Russia and anti-Russian ethnicity, but they spoke their major language was still Russian. So taken all of that, when the Russian television, radio stations, newspapers are banned, and I'm talking about Ukrainian Russian speakers, I'm not talking about Russia as such, then obviously there is a deeper fracture over there which has been created. And we have, all the, we have also had the rise of really fascist forces, right-wing forces in Ukraine who swear by essentially those groups which aligned with the Nazis mm -hmm. during the Second World War. So that is the internal fact fracture of Ukraine. But you know, there is a much larger historical issue. And if you take the whole of Eastern Europe, particularly after the fall of Soviet Union, when it breaks up, Yeltsin leads the breakup, right. signing the pact with Ukraine and Belarus that we don't recognize the Soviet Union anymore, we are dissolving it. And that's how he replaces Gorbachev and becomes the president of Russia rather than the president of Soviet Union. Now, when that happened, Yeltsin had the belief that all these countries will be partners of Western Europe and they will be allowed to peacefully integrate themselves into Europe. And his belief was, therefore, that NATO should really not expand any further towards the East up to Germany, yes, but no further. And all the Eastern European countries, including Russia, would be incorporated in a kind of friendship partnership. I think it was called Progress and Friendship Program, which by which they will be integrated. And they will have a European, uh, kind of European, uh, larger Europe, if you will, which will then be the part in which Russia will also be recognized. Russia's aspiration has been Europe to be recognized by Europe for quite some time. Right. And that goes back three, 400 years. So if we look at that, the Americans were very much against it from the beginning. And now the internal correspondence has recently been uh, made public by freedom of uh, information. So all these documents are now in public domain. And it is very clear, the Americans didn't want that to happen, but it's a very simple reason. They lose their dominance over Europe. And NATO was their instrument of doing that. So they wanted to reconfigure NATO as an instrument of domination of not only Europe, but also the rest of the world. In fact, NATO was then going to look out of Europe as well, becoming the main genre arm, if you will, of big capital, global capital, of course, which the United States was the key one. And in their view, therefore, Yeltsin had to be bamboozled into accepting the eastward march of NATO. Yeltsin was very upset. At one point, he and uh, Clinton had a public spat where he uh, shouted at Clinton. But he was going to be very delicately placed, shall we say, in an election, I think in 1996. And Clinton said, OK, I'll help you win. And that seems to have got over Yeltsin. But the Russian state saw that as a threat as NATO marched right up to its borders right. and set up missile batteries from Baltics, Romania, Poland, and now it threatens to come up to Ukraine. And that Ukrainian border, it's already in Ukraine. So now it is giving, putting down red lines that if we do this, this is not acceptable. If you don't accept our red lines, what you're really saying, you can put missile batteries which can re reach our command centers in Moscow in five minutes. And if you do that, that is something not acceptable to us. And Putin has said our response will then be, of course, hypersonic missiles and right. so on and so forth. So you get a renewed arms race. Mm -hmm. You get a hair trigger alert. You're talking of nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons. You're really in a territory which is completely uncharted, except at the height of Cold War, the Cuban war, for example, you know, Cuban blockade, for example. Right. And I think that is a very, very dangerous period to go back to. But we seem to be walking into this with the Americans doing it with their eyes wide shut, as they say, because they seem to believe all of this will have no consequences. So one side you have Ukraine, other side you have uh, Taiwan, and they seem to be willing to ratchet up 
pressures against both Russia and China right. simultaneously on these two fronts. So I really am I'm, I'm not clear what is the vision they have or are they walking us into a global Armageddon with their eyes open or eyes shut. Thank you so much, Prabir. That's all your time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.